Well, that was full circle, and I'm really honoured to have to the left of me, Mr. Tony Klinger. Tony, that was um, an incredible piece of work, and it took quite a long time to put together. And then it's been in the, not the ether, but um, you've showed it in 2008, I understand. And I then did, yes. And then you're, uh, here we are, 2018. I, I do have a reason. Um, cool. uh, as you saw, we made the film together, Arnon, Manuel and myself. Mm. And um, at that time, he was, as you saw, married to my daughter. Yes. And then, without going into details or anything yep. like that, uh, they split up. And as a consequence, there was a long hiatus before I could do anything with the film. Right, okay. And now we're starting to do something with the film again. You said something to me outside, which which really sort of struck a chord with me. You said, uh, you're the same, you're, or, or uh, come, your, uh, come November, you're going to be the same age as your father was. Uh, exactly. When he died. Our Are you calling me old? <laughs> no, no. I mean, I am the same age now as when my mother died. And yeah, in no, two I mean years' yeah. time, I'm going to be the same age I was when my father died. So it's, you know, it's not necessarily about age. I think you look at the, the generation up and you think, you start thinking, don't you? You start thinking about putting all these things together. And I just wondered if, if there was like a, an element of that in making sure that totally, it started to get out. Totally, there's an element of that. And, and the truth is that we see ourselves as we were, yeah. uh, not perhaps as we are. Uh, I, I, I often tell the story, this is the truth. It, it, in my head, I am my s son there, who's like six foot something, and he's, mm. he's a handsome young fellow, and uh, it, that's how I feel I look. Yeah. And then I walk past the shop window and I see my father, yep. and it's a shock. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can see you're a Greek over there. <laughs> and and uh, that's the truth of it. And, and those things actually bring you up short and make you think, mm. You know, there's not forever. You have to deal with uh, things in life. I also had an incident, uh, which I've <laughs> it's a strange incident, but it's, it pertains to this. Uh, a few years ago, I, I had an operation that went wrong. And I had an anaphylactic shock and, and, and died on the operating table. Hmm. Unfortunately, as you can see, they brought me back. <laughs> and <laughs> and in, in, in that, that also made me think, I've got to get on with things. Yeah. Because you don't have infinite time. That's the one thing none of us have got. And so you have to use the time as, and if you're a creative person, that means you have to go and create. Yeah. So that that's the answer to your question. Yeah. So let's talk slightly more positively now. <laughs> so um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your past, your career, and uh, yeah, a little bit of everything, really? Well, I was um, very fortunate in that I had no idea of what I was doing to start with. So as a consequence of that, I had no fear. Mm. And I entered the industry as a 16-year-old, as a wanting to make films because I'd won some writing prizes and knew that I wanted to write for films. And as a 16-year-old, you have no idea how you're going to do that. Mm. And so consequently, I worked in the daytime on shows like The Avengers, and at night time, I was borrowing equipment from the <laughs> studios I was working at and making small documentaries. Mm. And that led me on to connections with people in the music industry because when we were making those documentaries, we couldn't afford to um, acquire the rights to the music, so we mm. had to go and convince people to give them to us for virtually nothing. And amongst those people were people like Supertramp and, and, and fairly famous people. Uh, they weren't at that time, mm. they were as broke as me. And so, that led to a knowledge of people in the publishing, music publishing industry, etc. And from that, we started to realise we could actually work with these people and they wanted to work with us. And at that time, those were called rock videos in those days, they were called pop promos. Mm -hmm. And it was literally pretty much they'd seen you something you'd done or somebody knew somebody and you got linked in. And very quickly it became apparent to me that there were two ways you could go. And I spoke with uh, another guy, there was another guy in the industry at the time, and he said, we had a, a lunch together, he said, I'm gonna just do it cheap and cheerful, I'm gonna make these things real quick, and I'm gonna dominate the industry by doing it very inexpensively, and I'll do a good deal and then get on with it. And so I figured, well, if he's gonna do that, I'll do the opposite. And so I thought, if I can get people that I really like, and I do it for as much as I can make, mm -hmm. and then I can be more selective. 
and I was very fortunate because I got introduced uh, at one stage to the guys at Deep Purple and they were huge, uh, particularly in America, I mean, uh, unbelievably big. And they were willing to listen to my <laughs> craziness. And so I did a film with their part of their uh, people called uh, The Butterfly Ball, mm -hmm. uh, which was Roger Glover and Alan Aldrich. And that led on to me doing some work via another friend of mine with Roger Daltrey uh, for his album, One of the Boys. And that led on to them asking me, would I make a film with The Who? Yeah. Uh, because it had been very successful. And from there, it was, so that, <laughs> I've just given you like a snippet, but that was between those two things, seven years or something. Mm. Um, it, it, I've heard it described as seven years hard because it was actually, uh, with people that successful, they live in a kind of different bubble. Yep. And they're used to people, all people saying yes to them. Mm -hmm. And and I I'm not good at that. <laughs> it's one of my weaknesses. <laughs> I argue. And so what happened was that I got to do the things I wanted to do. The budgets in those days were kind of unlimited um, if you went that route. And you got to see the best and the worst of people. Mm -hmm. But I had an absolute rule, which was I wouldn't do work with a group. I didn't like the music, or didn't like the management and things. But that soon goes by the wayside because you become part of that bubble. Mm -hmm. you, you, your, your reality is unreal. Yeah. And so we went forward and had a fantastic time in some respects. But one of the things um, I learned, particularly in the, in the music s sector, was that it was a huge mistake to let the people that you were filming be the financiers of the film. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I suffered from that on both occasions. And... Uh, I wrote a book about it, which is coming in second edition just now called The Who and I. Uh, first edition was called Twilight of the Gods, which goes back through that period. And the reason I wrote it wasn't primarily, although I, <laughs> I like to get paid, but the reason I wrote it was because I wanted uh, other people who were going in the industry to learn the, 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 the do's and don'ts, because mm -hmm. uh, I certainly learned some don'ts. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that, so my lesson from it was it was, it was great fun, hugely enjoyable. I look back at it fondly, but I'm glad I'm not doing it now. Yeah. When you, uh, I'm not saying necessarily stopped, but your your career took a, a slightly different path. You started looking towards uh, documentaries and you started looking to, uh, uh, you did the documentary on the oceans and, and things like yeah. that. It, what What element of your career have you found the most enjoyable when it comes to filmmaking? Well, funnily enough, I go back one step to where I started. Uh, the thing I most enjoy is writing. Right. And so I think everything flows from the ability to tell a story mm -hmm. fluently. And so I like to, to make films on the things that I've written. Yeah. Uh, and all of the, th in fact, all of the things I've done, I've written. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, and, and then I find challenging uh, things uh, a, a, a great thing to motivate me. So, for example, writing books was a challenge. Writing plays was a challenge, and I've managed to do those things. But the documentaries started um, because they were cheaper to make, uh, to be honest, and, and very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did a film about the Cannes Film Festival, which did remarkably well called The Festival Game. And then we made a film about the ex uh, called Extremes, which is about young people and drug addiction, hard drug addiction mm -hmm. and heroin. In, in London in that period. And then we made something for CBS called The Last Crop, uh, it, all of which built towards me then <laughs> getting to a point in life where my then partner, a guy called Mike Lytton, sat me down and we were trying to figure out our next project. And he said, do you know how much we've earned in the last three years? And I said, no, I haven't really worked it out. He said, well, if you work it out and average it, we've earned 10 pounds a week each. He said, I can't pay my bills. Mm. And so we then had to move forward in a way that we could survive. So he went to America and worked in the oil business. And I then worked as a line producing kind of person up, up the, and then up the ranks on big feature films, um, which is also fun, but of a completely different kind, mm. because it goes from being a, a kind of art form when you're making a film, kind of you and a tiny team, to becoming more of a craft, because mm -hmm. there's now 200 people standing there doing something or nothing and <laughs> waiting around for to do something. And so it's fun, but it's making films by checkbook rather than by 
sheer, sheer talent. And, and then as time went on, I started to do other things. Um, and for a long period, I, I have to admit, I got immersed so much in the business end because I had to, mm. that there came a point where I, st I stopped enjoying it. And so at that point, I, I went into a different phase of our lives with the help and encouragement of my wife, where for a period of uh, like a decade, I became a, a university lecturer and then a director of a university and stuff like that. Um, and I loved it. Mm. And the thing that that did was that the passion of the young students made me get my passion back. Yep. Um, and I started to enjoy it again. And, and then I felt the flow of, yeah, I could start writing again. And it, it actually was the best period in fun terms mm -hmm. of my life because it, it was, it was great, a great break from the pressure of the constant commercial viability of every project. And then I suppose I've come around full circle, like the title of yep. the film, because I've got back into production in feature films and I've, I've, you know, I've got a play coming and I've got a three books out and, you know, it's a, it, 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 I needed those, I needed something to motivate me. I yep. think everybody, if you have a career as long as mine, and it's, it's 50 years, yeah, uh, fifty-two years, I think, um, and I look remarkably young. I should say. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, you don't need to say these things. It's just a given, isn't it? Uh. <laughs> but the but the the <laughs> the element that that I that drives you forward is that you wish to carry on doing it. it you can't motivate yourself because of the deal. Yeah. You have to motivate yourself because you wake up in the morning and you love it. You've got a as we've already touched upon, a fascinating kind of back catalogue of work, but so much of it isn't available. In this day and age with video on demand, have you got a drive to look at trying to get some of this out there and make it more accessible again to the public? We, we've been doing exactly that for the last year. Uh, we've done a deal with the company that also publishes my books, called Gonzo Media and we've uh, got Festival Game it's been reissued uh, the Extremes film has been reissued uh, they're going they've been trying to reissue the Butterfly Ball but there's huge arguments so I won't go into those uh, and the music stuff has been uh, being reissued and my books are out uh, yes there's always going to be something I can't get yep. and I feel the same way about my father's work um, and, and want to uh, make that accessible to everybody in one sort of collection. And mm. to that end, I uh, donated uh, his archives and, and, and most of mine to the University of West of England. And they did a big, huge research doc, uh, thing with it uh, about independent film production, which is, <laughs> it sounds so easy, doesn't it? Just mm. saying those words, independent film production, hardest thing in the world. Mm. Um, and it's hard for everybody. And it doesn't get easier when you see companies like Netflix and Amazon actually just rebranded film studios. Yeah. Same thing again, uh, but maybe even more powerful. Mm. I'm not saying there's any, I've got an argument against them, or, you know, and as you can see, lots of positives. However, who, who owns the, the, the pipeline owns the industry and yeah. they own the pipeline. Yeah. So on that, on that subject, now uh, obviously uh, let's look at full circle technology has moved on considerably from there. Uh, how do you see the British film industry at the moment? And, you know, if you were moving forward with a another project, you know, like tomorrow, if you're not, get on with it. Um, how, how would you work now? Well, I, interestingly, I was in Los Angeles last month with my family there, and I was talking to the guy who used to be one of my managers, and he's a great guy, very knowledgeable, been there forever. And I was talking against the idea of doing everything with the Netflixes of the world. Not again, I want to emphasize, they are very useful in some regards, yep. and uh, of course that's the case. And he turned around and said to me, you're nuts. And I asked him why, and he said, well, sometimes a deal is better than no deal. Mm. And my argument was about residuals and, and the fact that, you know, that there aren't any with, when you go with those. He said, yes, but there's a film there. Yeah. Um, and the truth is we've never achieved in the British film industry critical mass, so we're not really an industry mm. because we don't own the pipeline. So what, as a consequence, we've got is a misconception about what we are. 
uh, we are an outdoor workshop for the Americans, and we are also a small cultural imper culturally imperative little film business. Uh, like the French are, like the Italians are. And I, I love the French and Italian mm. films. I've always done so. But the truth is that when we are working with them, uh, we are doing a film because it's, it's, it's a thing that we must reflect our society. What the Americans are doing is cr creating, owning, and overpowering everybody in, in a marketing commercial sense. They completely dominate the world markets. And if the Chinese raise up, then they'll be into that. They're whatever works. And we still don't believe in the marketplace. No. And so what we have are, occasionally we'll fluke it. We'll do something that's so brilliant, it'll break through. And then everybody goes, it's the renaissance. Everybody in the film industry, it's wonderful. It's the best thing since sliced bread. And then it goes back to sleep for two years. <laughs> and the truth is that it doesn't need to be like that. I've been arguing this since I was a kid. Yeah. Because we could, we do make films that the Americans think are American, like Gravity, like Aliens, like Superman, and they're actually made here mm. by British people. But we, we are an outdoor workshop because all we look, get from that are the craft skills payments for us as suppliers to them who take the money. Yep. And they take the money and then they use it to, to continue the domination. So you can't argue with it because if you do, you're silly. But you've got, you've, and, and there's no way around it unless we ever had a company in the UK that would spend the money to buy into what they've got. Yeah. Like Vivendi did at Universal. Um, and we could have done that 50 times because we have very rich companies. But the truth is we don't do that because we don't think really of the film industry as an industry. Okay. Um, have we got any questions out here? Go on, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, when you were working on um, Full Circle, obviously, you know, it's so hard that you're always going to put your heart into a film anyway, but how, what was the challenge of um, keeping it as objective as possible when it was also your son-in-law's story, partly? That's a great question, and, and it's one that, that, that troubled me at the time. Um, I wanted to be totally objective. One of our arguments that became a huge row was that he he kind of wanted it to be a home movie. Um, and and so we had a big ongoing dispute that went on for two years. Um, because every time he tried to put it one way, I was pulling it back the other way. Um, and I've tried to make it as an objective, an edit as I could, because you know with documentaries you make it in the editing room, really. And um, it's not something that could ever be resolved, because in, in, in and he says it in the film, he's, he's quite honest about it, it's a therapy for him. And I felt, he, I mean, he asked me to make the film with him. It, it, that came that way around. And in effect, I was like his deputy father figure. And so it was very hard to maintain objectivity. But I was trained as a documentarian. That's where I started. And so I had to keep pulling it back because I can't, I can't be that subjective. You have to tell the truth. And I think we did, I think we did, but it, it, it was very hard. And I think he was very brave initially to allow me to, to, to do it, and very polite and nice. But I can see why he found it very difficult right to the end. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, one last question. What is now uh, important to you in life? Oh, my family um, is first. and. Telling stories, I, I think that we all, every one of us, every one of the people here, in the end is a storyteller of some kind, of some order. And for me, it's a thing I have to do. And so even when I'm not, I, I fortunately got a commission to do something that, uh, presently. And I get up and I, it's my joy to write my 10 pages or so a day. Um, but even when it's not been a commissioned thing, uh, if you see the huge output of stuff I write, you'd realise that it's something I feel compelled to do. Mm -hmm. And so I would be doing that. And I'll, I, I wouldn't for a second think of retirement no. uh, because that's what I'm born to do. Yep. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yep, yep, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, thank you for talking to us. We're not quite done with you yet, okay. but we're done with you in this screen. Um, we're going to have another little chat outside, if that's okay. okay. Thank you very um, much. Thank you very much.